What constitutes a good work? Well, that's the message this morning. Good works, and then a little later on, good words. But what constitutes a good work? Well, if you look it up in the dictionary, it simply says charitable acts. Well, it's kind of hard to argue with that. So charitable acts or acts of kindness towards your fellow man. And I think we would agree with that. So if you would uh, turn to James chapter two. So that's the dictionary definition of good works. But what does the Bible say about good works? Jesus said in Matthew chapter five, you probably remember this. He said, you are the light of the world. So let your light shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your father, which is in heaven. So biblically speaking, a person's works are contrasted with their faith, right? So the works are external, it's on the outside. Your faith is internal, it's on the inside. I think we all know that our faith and our works should go hand in hand and we should be able to show people our faith by our works. And of course, that's what the book of James is all about. So we're gonna be reading James chapter two, starting in verse eight. We'll read through verse 20 and be commenting as we go along. <clears throat> James says in verse 8, If you really fulfill the royal law according to the scripture, you shall love your neighbor as yourself, you do well. But if you show partiality, if you show favoritism, you commit sin and are convicted by the law as transgressors. For whoever shall keep the whole law and yet stumble in one point, he is guilty of all. For he who said, do not commit adultery, also said, do not murder. Now, if you do not commit adultery, but you do murder, you have become a transgressor of the law. So speak and so do as those who will be judged by the law of liberty. For judgment is without mercy to the one who has shown no mercy. Mercy triumphs over judgment. So the first thing I want to point out here, point number one, is that obeying God does constitute a good work. There are people who think that unless you're working in a soup kitchen or unless you're clothing the destitute, you're not really doing any good works. But really, obeying God does constitute a good work work. And let's face it, there are people, and we appreciate any good work a person does for their fellow man, but there are people who do feed the hungry, who do clothe the destitute, but in their personal lives, some of them may be living in rebellion against God. And that's obviously not what the Lord wants. He wants the faith and the works. He wants our heart to be right along with the things that we do on the outside. Uh, the Bible tells us that obedience is better than sacrifice. And Titus 3.5 makes it clear that obeying God, it is a work of righteousness. It is a good work. So being an honest person, right? If you find a wallet on the ground and you pick it up and you return it to the person with the money still in it, right? You don't, well, hey, I don't know where all the money went, but here's your license and credit cards. No, with the money still in it, right? Doing the right thing. That's a good work. If you get back too much change from the cashier, excuse me, ma'am, you gave me a 20 instead of a 10. It'd be real easy just to kind of walk away, right? But doing the right thing is a good work. A husband working hard to provide for his family, uh, a faithful mother raising her children, being faithful to one another, being faithful to a local church. These are good works, okay? And they really lay a foundation to build upon. And not only does God see it, other people see it, right? And that's all part of having a good testimony. There is few things uh, better, more important than having a good reputation and a good testimony. What is that? Letting your light shine before men. That's what it is. So number one, obeying God is a good work. Number two, when it comes to helping the poor, and as Linda mentioned, that song was about helping the poor. Uh, and we all know that we should help people in need. So if you have the opportunity to help someone who is truly in need, absolutely we should do that. But the problem is in our society, 
And listen, I think we have to be honest about this because this is a real problem, especially in our area, but really all across the country. When we help others, are we helping or hurting? I think we need to uh, look at that. A new pastor came to town and he asked me, he said, what's the deal with all the people begging on the streets? You know, they're in the medium, they're on the side of the road and they're begging. He wasn't used to seeing that where he came from. So I told him, and I got this advice also from people who work in shelters and, and work with uh, people like that. And uh, I told him, you know, the problem is if you give a beggar $20, you really don't know, is he going to buy food or is he going to buy drugs or alcohol? Because if you give him $20 and he buys food, then you are helping him out. But if he buys heroin, then your good work is actually doing harm. And I think we all know that that is a real problem in our society today. Another pastor told me a story. There is a man out on the street and he had a sign. And the sign said, hungry, anything helps, God bless. And you notice all the signs seem to say God bless. And I don't think that's a coincidence. Well, he decided he was going to help the man. He's hungry, right? That's what the sign said. He went into McDonald's and uh, I realized that's not the best meal, but for someone who's hungry, it's, it's not that bad if you're really hungry. So he went in, he bought him uh, a meal, he brought it out to him and he handed it to the man. The guy was so upset, disgusted, he literally swatted it out of his hand. And then I think said a few choice words that we can't repeat uh, here this morning. Why would he do that? because he really wasn't hungry, he wanted the money. Now, we know that these things happen. They're happening all the time. We can't pretend that it's not happening. Uh, but the danger there is to just say, you know what, forget it. I don't trust anybody, I'm not gonna help anybody. That's a real danger that we could maybe fall into that type of thinking. But you know what, there are some people who genuinely need help. And even the people that are hooked on drugs, right? They really do need help. And, you know, taking a judgmental approach because this is a growing problem, that really doesn't do any good. Uh, yeah, it's wrong. I mean, I think they know it's wrong, but they need help. And I think Christians ought to keep their hearts and minds open. If you have a friend, a family member, a coworker to help those people who need it. Now, of course, they need to want the help, right? Uh, you can't want it for them, but we should keep our hearts open uh, to that possibility and not just say, you know what, I don't trust anyone, forget it all. Uh, James talks about the royal law of scripture in verse eight. And we know how Jesus, who is the King of Kings, summarized the 10 commandments by loving God and loving one another. But he says here, James does, if you show partiality, you commit sin. And because of this, I think, and this is point number three, I think we ought to go out of our way to help people that are not like us. You know, and that can be hard sometimes. It can be difficult because if we show favoritism and we only love those who love us, or we only help those who are like us, we only reach out to people who, you know, we can relate to, what reward will we have? I think Jesus said something about that. Didn't he say something, you know, if you only love those who love you, you're no better than anyone else. Even the worst of sinners uh, live that way. So consider this, Jesus was sinless, right? And who did he reach out to? He reached out to sinners. Now the apostles, they were Jewish. And who did they eventually reach out to? They reached out to Gentiles, and back then, Jews and Gentiles didn't have much in common. So uh, we need to reach out to those who are not like us. Uh, to summarize verses 10 through 13, uh, it's clear that while we may not have broken every commandment, certainly not indeed, we haven't broken all of the commandments, we have broken some. I don't think anyone would deny that. And the point that James is making is not that all sin is equal, and we've talked about this, or some people think all sin is sin, all sin is equal. Well, murder is a lot worse than telling what people call a little white lie. I mean, obviously we know some sins are more serious than others, but the point 
he's making is not that all sin is equal. Rather, we are all equally guilty of sin. We all stand before God as sinners. And because of that, we want grace and mercy from God. Of course we do. So we should show grace and mercy to others. Now, when it comes to the subjects of works in the Bible, uh, I think this in James 2 is one of those passages that sometimes it gets neglected, especially amongst evangelicals. It, it gets neglected a little bit, but I think we need to remember uh, that James, what is he teaching on? Is James teaching us how to be saved? No, he's teaching how saved people are supposed to live. Take a look at verse 14. He says, what does it profit, my brethren, if someone says he has faith but does not have works? Can faith save him? Now, the implication is no. And if we kept reading, you'd see that. One of you says to them, depart in peace, be warmed and filled, but you do not give them the things which are needed for the body. What does it profit? What does it profit? Well, it doesn't profit anything, right? Thus also faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. Now, really, we live in the most prosperous nation I think the world has ever seen. So this is also a nation that has a Christian heritage. So it's unlikely that you're actually going to find a situation like this where someone is without clothing or they're truly going hungry. Uh, you're probably not even going to run into something like that. If you do, it's almost unimaginable that you wouldn't help them out. So because we live in a prosperous nation, because we live in a nation with Christian principles, uh, this is probably not something we're going to come across very much. Uh, but you remember we had a missionary uh, share a few weeks ago, or maybe a month or two ago by now, and he actually said that in some Eastern nations, there are people that refuse to help the destitute. If someone is hungry, they're in the worst situation, maybe by no fault of their own, there are actually people that refuse to help them. Now, it has something to do with their Eastern religion and, and karma. I forget the details, but that does, it does happen. So if we ever have the opportunity to help someone who's truly in need, this is the last thing. This is point number four. The last thing we ought to do is say, you know what? God bless you. I'll pray for you. And then <laughs> move along and not do anything to help them out. If you can help them and you don't, just don't say anything, okay? Because that's the ultimate hypocrisy to say, I'll pray for you, but I'm not going to help you even though I could. So don't do that. Now, if someone is asking you for money or if they're asking you for things, and you know, I might make one or two people mad at me this morning, I don't know, but hopefully you'll have mercy. We wanna show mercy to people, right? But uh, this is what the Bible teaches. I always tell people, did Pastor Grant write the Bible? Did I write the Bible? Then don't blame me for what's in the Bible. But if you want to, go ahead. I'll, I'll take it. If someone asks us for things and yet they refuse to work, do we have to give it to them? Well, you know, if they ask you for things and they refuse to work, the Bible teaches, Paul teaches, if a man doesn't work, he shall not eat. Now, that's what the Bible said. That's not what I said. Uh, there's a saying out there, and I know there's a few people that don't like this, but I believe it's true. I can't give you chapter and verse, but the saying goes something to the effect that the Lord helps those who help themselves. I really believe that because if you just sit on your couch and say, well, I'm not going to do anything, but Lord bless me. You know, Lord, I need this and I need, but you're not willing to do anything about it. Well, I really do believe the Lord helps those who uh, help themselves. Uh, also, if a person refuses to provide for his own family. Now listen, if someone doesn't have a wife and kids and they choose to do whatever they choose to do, they don't want to wear, that's up to them, I suppose. But if you have a wife and kids and you refuse to provide for your own family, what does the scripture say about that? That person is worse than an infidel. Okay, worse than an unbeliever. Those are pretty... Harsh statement, some people would say, but it's not harsh. It's good advice. It's common sense to some extent. So we should help people who are truly in need, but we cannot enable people. And that's sort of the whole point that I'm trying to get to. Now, 
In our society, the government has a lot of safety nets, right? There's all sorts of programs. If someone wants help, there's help out there. There probably is a rare uh, case here and there where someone falls through the cracks. And if that situation ever presents itself or someone does fall through the cracks and you can help them, we should absolutely do it. Why? Because faith without works is dead. In verse 18, someone will say, you have faith and I have works. Show me your faith without your works and I will show you my faith by my works. James says, you believe there is one God? You do well. Even the demons believe and tremble. Even the demons believe. But do you want to know, O foolish man, that faith without works is dead? So sometimes this is a neglected passage amongst evangelicals. Why? Because there is a lot of uh, easy believism out there. That's one of the terms for easy believism, where people uh, accept Jesus into their heart. And I believe in accepting Jesus into your heart. You pray, you ask God to forgive you. I believe a person can be saved through one prayer. I absolutely believe that. However, there are some who, and hopefully no one in this church, amen? <laughs> but, you know, there are some who think that because they said a prayer, that gives them carte blanche, right? Uh, the Catholics have a version of this. Uh, basically, it's get baptized as a baby, go through CCD or catechism, get confirmed, and then never go back. <laughs> you probably know of a few situations like that. Maybe that describes a couple of you uh, back in the day. Uh, if they're more committed, what do they do? Some of them. Obviously, this is not all. This is some. Um, some people, if they're more committed, they go... Sunday, get absolution, and then sort of live like the devil Monday through Saturday, and then go back on Sunday to be forgiven. Well, Protestants have a version of this. We have a version of this, and it's, I said the sinner's prayer, and once saved, always saved, so I can do whatever I want. That's the mindset. That is easy believism. And really, this is an epidemic in the church today, and I think pastors have to take some responsibility for this. This is why we need to preach the whole counsel of God. And we need to preach that faith without works is dead. Why? Because that's what the Bible says. James says, you believe in God. Take a look at that. Verse 19. You believe there is one God. Well, that's great. That's wonderful. But even Satan believes that. Isn't that what he's saying? So believing in God is not the issue. The issue is having a real, personal, committed trust in Jesus. And if it's real, there is going to be outward evidence of that real, personal, committed trust. Not salvation by faith plus works. No, we reject that. But there's going to be some evidence. And people will say, ah, yeah, that's true. But, you know, God, oh, God really only cares about what's on the inside. You've all heard this. You've probably all said it. I know I have at some point. God only cares about what's on the inside. You know how it goes. And there is a, a scripture where it says, man looks on the outward appearance, but God looks upon the heart. So the conclusion that some come to is the outside doesn't matter. What you do doesn't matter. All that matters is what's in the heart. That's all that matters. Well, number one, that's sort of taking that verse out of context a little bit. That's number one. Number two, it sort of sounds like it could be an excuse for bad behavior. And James is a book that is attacked by some people, but it's just as much the word of God as any other book of the Bible. And it clearly tells us that what we do, it does matter. It does matter. And on top of that, what's on the outside it's usually a pretty good indicator for what's on the inside. Not always. I'm sure there are exceptions, but usually it's a pretty good indicator. Uh, Jesus spoke about this. The scribes, Pharisees, right? They looked really good on the outside. They looked really religious and pious on the outside. But what did Jesus call them? Whitened sepulchers. You look good on the outside, but within you are corrupt. Jesus said, clean the inside of the cup so that the outside will be clean as well. What's he saying? Only the inside matters? No, the inside and the outside.
outside should be clean. So uh, that's what we would say. We would say that faith without works is dead. Now, point number five, just to reiterate, so no one would get the wrong idea. I don't think you would, but obviously we know our faith cannot save us. And there are many professing Christians where Christianity to them uh, there are some where it's all about faith and no works, but then there are some where it's all about works and no faith. Well, it's supposed to be faith and works. We want the works. Good works are good, right? They help people, right? They bring glory to God. So self-righteousness is when you think that your works justify you before God. Imagine when a person dies, they go to heaven, they walk through the pearly gates, down the streets of gold, uh, into the heavenly sanctuary, past the cherubim and seraphim angels, up to the throne of God, and they say, move over, now there's two of us. <laughs> well, listen, that ain't ever going to happen, ever. But that's what it's like, the person who is self-righteous, that I'm so good, of course God is going to accept me because I'm such a good person. That's sort of what it's like. Well, why do we think that? Why do people think that? Because you can always find someone worse. Isn't that true? You can always find someone worse. Uh, the only problem is you can always find someone better. So, you know, that doesn't really leave you anywhere. Uh, now, if you would, uh, turn to Hebrews chapter 11. Hebrews chapter 11. Uh, we believe it is God who defines good and evil. And since God defines what is good, he does this in his moral law. God will give us the guidelines as to what constitutes a good work. I have a few things here. Um, you can uh, agree or disagree, I suppose. But uh, a good work in the sight of God, I, I do believe this is scriptural. Number one, a good work that is pleasing to God will bring him glory. Number one. Number two, it must conform to his truth. And then number three, a good work must have the right motives behind them. So take a look at Hebrews 11, verses 5 and 6. By faith, Enoch was taken away so that he did not see death and was not found because God had taken him. For before he was taken, he had this testimony that he pleased God. But without faith, it is impossible to please him. For he who comes to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. Uh, Jesus also said in John chapter 6, he said, this is the work of God, that you believe in him whom he sent. So we are to believe, obey, have a good testimony, have our own house in order, and then and only then can we really be effective in ministering to the needs of others. If we will do that, if we really seek God and ask for those opportunities, I have no doubt God can keep you busy the rest of your life doing good works. There's always something we can do. Uh, it's just a matter of, does God have willing servants? So now let's move on to the subject of good words. We've talked about good works, now good words. Open to Proverbs chapter 18. Proverbs chapter 18. So the way we think, the way we speak, the things that we say to others and the things that we say to ourselves, they really do have an effect. Whether it's positive or negative, our words really do make a difference. We see that here in Proverbs. So let's start out by reading these two verses and we're coming to the end. Proverbs 18 verses 20 and 21. A man's stomach shall be satisfied from the fruit of his mouth. From the produce of his lips he shall be filled. Death and life are in the power of the tongue, and those who love it will eat its fruit. So point number one, uh, good words, whatever we say, whatever comes out of our mouth, let's face it, it comes from our mind. Or as we might say, it comes from our heart. That's where it starts. So how we think absolutely makes a difference. Philippians 4, 8 says, finally, brethren, whatever things are true, whatever things are noble, whatever things are just, whatever things are pure, whatever things are lovely, whatever things are of good report, if there is any virtue and if there is anything praiseworthy, think on these things. 
So if you have a negative thought, what do you want to do? Drive it out of your mind. Amen. Drive the negative thoughts out of your mind. Say, I can't help it. You know what? The spoken word is powerful enough to do that. Mm -hmm. Words of life. Say, God, help me. You know, if that negative thought comes in your mind, I can't control it. Praise God. Amen. Praise God. Start quoting scripture. Now, if you're in a room of people and you're doing that and talking to yourself, they'll think you're crazy, but maybe <laughs> under your breath, maybe if you have to, you know, but it's true. The spoken word really has that power. So drive those thoughts out of your head. Jesus said, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. Point number two, the spoken word is both common and powerful. It's common because we do it every day. It's powerful because our words have the ability to define us. And also our words have the ability to define others, whether it's fairly or unfairly. The way we speak, and I think this is true, you'll acknowledge this, I believe. The way we speak, it'll determine how many enemies we have, right? If we have a lot of enemies, it's going to make life difficult. Some people, you know, they create more trouble for themselves just by running their mouth. <laughs> isn't, isn't that the case? You know, this is trouble that could all be avoided, but they just can't seem to control their tongue. James says, be slow to speak and be quick to listen. I know this one guy and, uh, you know, it's nobody here. Sometimes I'll preach on something. Who's he talking about? <laughs> There's nobody here, but I know this one guy, he, he's a nice guy, and I think he would have a lot of friends. I think his life would be totally different, but he just can't control his tongue. Where does it start? In the heart, in the mind, it comes out the mouth, and then it affects everybody and everything. So our words have the ability to affect not only how many enemies we have, it also has the ability to, point number three, to affect the way we feel, both, both emotionally and I believe physically. You know, there are some conditions that are associated with worrying and negativity. And I don't agree with some of the TV pastors who say that our words are vessels of power and they can create your own reality. That's the name it and claim it crowd, the word of faith. A lot of pastors on TV are word of faith. I don't agree with that. Uh, but there are some, you know, of all the lies out there, there's always some truth in every lie, right? Because nobody would believe it if that wasn't the case. It would just be ridiculous. Proverbs 18, 21, death and life are in the power of the tongue. So speaking positive words, optimistic words, speaking good things, kind things, it really does make a difference, doesn't it? Doesn't it just affect how you feel? You feel better. Now you can't create something out of nothing, but you can certainly change people's outlook on you, right? If you're consistently speaking words of death, how are people gonna look at you? Like, I don't wanna be around that guy. Now, if you speak words of life, it will definitely make a difference. And listen, I realize that sometimes things do pop into our mind and we can't really control what pops into our mind, but we can control what comes out of our mouth. Say, I, I just can't help it. Yes, you can. Yes, you can. Say, no, I can't help it. I just don't have a filter, right? You've heard that. I don't have a filter. Let the Holy Spirit be your filter. The Bible says we reap what we sow. And uh, if we speak those things which are true, those things which are pure, those things which are lovely, won't God see that and honor that? I believe he will. If we speak words of faith, God hears it. He will reward us as people of faith. And let's face it, our words really do oftentimes tell the tale of how much we are trusting in God and whether or not we are thankful to God. So let me just close with this, this kind of question, these questions to you. Are you thankful here this morning? Do you love God here this morning? Do you love others here this morning? And let's let our words and our works demonstrate it.